Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Considerations for Rigorous Preclinical Studies in Murine Muscular Dis uh, Dystrophy. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. This webinar is sponsored by Aurora Scientific and will feature Dr. Chris Ward and Dr. Ramsey Kerala from Myologica and Dr. Sharon Hester Lee from the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Today, they're going to present key considerations in the design of rigorous preclinical studies in rodent models of muscular dystrophy, including animal model selection, assays and endpoints, and how your results can inform translation to the clinic. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Chris Ward. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today, and feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you, Liam, and uh, thank you, Aurora. Uh, for uh, sponsoring this event with also the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And you'll hear from Sh Sharon uh, Hesterly toward the end of the presentation. I'm going to cover today some considerations of animal models of muscular dystrophy. Uh, in a, a really comprehensive review written in uh, 2015, Gerard et al. had a really nice definition of ideal animal models. An ideal animal model of muscular dystrophy should have the same genetic basis and reiterate key hallmarks and progression of the human pathology, and also have a robust and reproducible phenotype over generations. Uh, they also mentioned that it is best to be commercially available. So it's widely available to most investigators that can uh, also use the model and be readily maintainable with fairly low cost. And so there are many models of the muscular dystrophies, studied, modeled, identified in many vertebrate species, as well as invertebrates. Today we're talking about murine models or mice. Mice are very well suited for muscular dystrophy preclinical studies. Small body size, short gestation and lifespan allows relatively easy husbandry and time course of lifespan to study these animals. Easy to handle, treat, genetically modify, relatively inexpensive to maintain. Uh, and there's a lot of muscular dystrophy models available in the murine, uh, in, in murine systems. Many of these models have been extensively characterized. This gives us a, a, a rich set of data to inform the design interpretation of preclinical studies across several of the dystrophies. Again, in this very short context, don't have time to really go in depth. This is a graphic highlighting some of the more uh, uh, significant muscular dystrophies, mutations that arise in uh, genes linked to proteins at the muscle membrane. Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy arising from mutations in dystrophin. Limb girdle muscular dystrophy arising from several mutations in genes associated with disparate proteins, cabulin-3, calpane-3, dysferlin, sarcoglycans. Congenital muscular dystrophy, again, separate proteins, as well as proteins not represented in this graphic and transcription factors, FSHD, oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. I list these because they're, well, they're not on this graphic, but there are animal models for these uh, muscular dystrophies as well. So in brief, I just want to cover some considerations of your, these murine models. And I'll start with the most common muscular dystrophy, likely the most common studied murine model uh, of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Duchenne muscular dystrophy characterized by a rapidly progressive de degeneration of the skeletal muscle in young boys, delayed motor milestones. These young boys are wheelchair bound by the about the second decade of life. Improved standard of care has increased life expectancy from early teens to the third to fourth decade. But these young boys 
succumb to respiratory insufficiency and cardiomyopathy, uh, which is life limiting. So considering the murine models to study Duchenne, the most common model is the MDX mouse, arguably the most studied model of DMD. The standard MDX mouse is a naturally occurring DMD mutation in a colony of C57 black uh, 10 mice. There is additional models, variants of that MDX mouse, generated via chemical induced mutations in that C57 background, a number of variants with different mutations, as well as a DMD null. Uh, more recent cr model created by deleting the entire DMD genomic region. These models are valuable models when the limitations are considered and leveraged. The limitations are the mirroring MDX model does not fully exhibit the pathogenic progression seen in human DMD. A benefit of this model is indeed there's early necrosis and regeneration in hind limb muscles that peaks around three to four weeks of age, but then this degeneration regeneration cycle plateaus and resolves with no appreciable decrease in lifespan as seen in the human patient. Five minutes. This, this, Five. this is called the critical period. In this period, when we have this active regeneration, this is a valuable place to study the regenerative aspects of this dystrophy. The models also have severe locomotor muscle weakness, loss of muscle weight, accumulation of fat and fibrosis. However, it's not significant until greater than 14 months of age in this model. And so if these aspects are what are uh, of interest to study, these aspects need to be studied much later in the life of the animal. In contrast, the diaphragm undergoes a progressive degeneration. Regarding the heart, signs of cardiomyopathy don't appear until much later. So indeed, if trying to study heart in this model, these studies have to be initiated later in the animal's lifespan. Asynchronous to the early degeneration and recovery seen in the skeletal muscle. There are a number of variants, in, especially in the DMD MDX model, that have been created to enhance this phenotype. So dystrophin deficient mice and not humans increase their expression of eutrophin. This is a structural and functional paralog of dystrophin. And so models have been created to delete eutrophin on the background of DMD mutations, a full deletion, a eutrophin null on that MDX background, exhibits a very severe and rapidly progressive phenotype with early, early cardiac involvement. However, there's very early lethality at about 20 weeks of age. This is challenging for some mechanistic and therapeutic studies because of the severity of this disease. Again, in the haploinsufficient model, half the amount of eutrophin expressed. This is a less severe phenotype, but rapidly progressive, early cardiac involvement. This model has been shown to be more available to mechanistic and therapeutic discovery. There's also some other variants. It's established that mice have reduced inflammatory and immunologic reactivity versus humans in general. One of the aspects that has been identified uh, in the mouse, as far as the MDX, work at Children's Nationwide by Paul Martin's group has shown that the CMA gene, a gene that has been evolutionally re retained uh, in the mouse, offers some protection from this uh, enhanced inflammatory background. If this gene is deleted, in the background of the MDX, these mice have an enhanced inflammation, early and sustained skeletal muscle decline, and accelerated cardiac phenotype. And indeed, this model has been leveraged in genetic treatment studies 
and has shown benefit to uh, advance those treatment discoveries. Mouse strains different in their inflammatory background. Most muscular dystrophy models are commonly on the C57 black 6 or black 10 background strains. The DBA model, that background strain, an inbred mouse, carries a naturally occurring in-frame deletion. This deletion. And so DMD, MDX mouse, crossed on the background, back crossed into this DBA background, presents with a more severe progressive disease phenotype and cardiac involvement. Shifting from DMD, other muscular dystrophy models, SARCA, such as gamma sarcoglycan deficiency, this model has been shown to be enhanced when crossed into this DBA2 background as well. Shifting from DMD to limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2B. Limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2B arises from genetic mutations in the dysferlin gene. This protein is important for muscle membrane repair. It's a slowly progressive disease with muscle weakness and wasting of the muscles of the pelvis, lower limb, shoulder girdle, predisposing significant locomotor and postural dysfunction, no heart involvement in the patients. Age onset ranges from 15 to 35 years. It does not significantly shorten lifespan. So considering the models involved, the AJ is a naturally occurring dysferlin mutation this is considered a rel relatively weak model due to its lack of significant functional deficits. They're fairly mild when identified, very late onset, and very mild histological presentation. Another challenge of this model is it's an uncommon background strain. It's a cross between the bulb C, or the bad albino, and the cold spring harbor albino, such that there's no ideal wild type control. On the background of the Blah J, the AJ crossed into the black six, or a genetic deletion of exons 53 to 55, both of these models more recapitulate this human phenotype. At two months of age, identify a necrotic incension of the excited fibers. Eight months of age, muscle develops all the pathological characteristics of muscular dystrophy. And in order of severity, there are different muscles affected, which also is clinically relevant, but will have to be considered in the phenotyping and exploration of these models. Inflammation has also been shown to be a negative disease modifier. Oxidative stress has been shown to contribute to this decrease in membrane repair. NERF2 is a transcription factor, regulating a family of genes, essential for detoxifying ROS. The genetic deletion of NERF2 in the AJ mouse, the mild mouse, effectively increases disease pathology and severity. And so this is another option to increase severity in disparate models by targeting oxidative stress. So in summary, what I've tried to uh, cover and get some appreciation for is to optimize the study of dystrophic pathology, whether mechanistic study of the disease pathology or the development of therapeutic approaches, it's important to consider the disease severity and the temporal progression seen in your murine model and leverage those changes for therapeutic discovery. Thank you very much. And now I'm, I'm gonna turn the uh, talk over to Ramsey Kerala, who is gonna talk about considerations of testing and evaluating these phenotypes in these murine models. Thank you, Chris. Uh... That was very interesting. Um, and I'm going to mostly uh, talk about the most common assays and their pitfalls. Once you've made a decision um, regarding the model that you want to choose, uh, now comes the time to carefully design which assays will best address your experimental hypothesis. There are a multitude of functional assays that can be run. Uh, but if we want to broadly categorize them, we can break them down uh, into categories, the neurocentric assays and the muscle-centric assays. In the neurocentric assays, we're mostly talking about um, assays that use fully conscious mice, 
that are uh, non-invasive, behavioral in nature, in that they are motivation or fear-based. In the more muscle-centric assays, these usually used either anesthetized animal or, or the isolated model uh, muscle, all the way down to isolated single primary myocytes. Because they're more invasive, they usually require a little more technique, a little more time, they're a bit more difficult, so they can be uh, less amenable to repeat measures. So on this slide, I've listed a few of the most common assays performed in muscular dystrophy studies. Um, this list is obviously not comprehensive, and in the context of this webinar, I haven't included any cardiac assays either. But in general, most of the studies we see in the literature will have a combination of a few of these. I will not be going over how to run these assays, however, because there's great resources already out there for this. Over a decade ago, Treat NMD, NIH, Foundation to Eradicate Duchenne, and the Wellstone Muscular Dystrophy Center at Children's in DC hosted meetings with, with experts. Their goal was to develop a series of SOPs to test the effects of new treatments in animal models of dystrophy and improve the comparability of studies across labs. Uh, the protocols that resulted from these meetings are now hosted on the Treat NMD Neuromuscular Network website and are regularly updated to keep up with the changes in the literature. Um, I've listed the SOP reference numbers uh, here next to each appropriate, to, to, the, to the relevant assay. And we've also included uh, the link to the Treat NMD website uh, in the webinar resources. Um, what I wanted to do with this, with this presentation is give a little bit more context to the assays that are suggested by the network. As in a given studies, you certainly don't want to run all the assays and you want to choose the most appropriate one for your goals. I've loosely arranged the assays from the most neuro based uh, with open field and rotor rod uh, being very CNS dependent to the most muscle centric with isolated muscle in a bath and isolated primary myocytes being uh, basically almost all muscle. Um, now, when you do these assays, you can further combine them with um, measure, secondary measures such as histology, looking at fibrosis or cross-sectional area, for example, or uh, adding circulating biomarker, biomarker measurements. Um, as an added layer of complexity, you can combine two of the assays together, two or more of the assays together. Uh, for example, in DMD, where susceptibility to injury plays a central role in disease progression, you can perform downhill running on a treadmill um, and look at the open field performance after that, or you can injure muscle directly in vivo or in vitro, and then look at histology or increased damage markers, etc. So the, the number of options is near limitless and it helps to understand what each assay is measuring, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each assay to better inform uh, study design. And so I'm gonna go through a couple of these assays and kind of highlight what you need to think about if you're choosing that assay. Some of the oldest assays in neuroscience are the open field and rotor rod uh, assays, Gener generically, they assay locomotor activity, balance, grip strength, physical endurance, motor coordination, etc. These assays are easy to establish. They require little user training and are generally not particularly stressful on the animals, which makes them important assays if you're looking for repeat measures. However, both of these assays are highly CNS dependent. Open field, for example, is validated using benzodiazepam in anxiety and depression studies whereas Rotorod is the accepted assay for traumatic brain injury. In the context of muscular dystrophy, in advanced stages of disease where the animal might be depressed or have an altered mental state, it might be difficult to discriminate a muscle phenotype from a CNS-dependent phenotype. Um, in addition, uh, you can combine 
injury and then look at open field and that might allow you to uh, improve the muscle relevance of your results. Um, moving to a little more muscle centric, uh, but still mostly CNS dependent, more in line with the natural behavior uh, of the mouse are the running type assays, such as voluntary running wheel or forced treadmill. Um, these mimic the natural foraging behavior of the mouse in its natural habitat. They are simple to perform, the wheel a lot more so than the treadmill, you just put a wheel in the cage. Um, however, exercise, uh, they're also easy, low to medium stress, so you're not, you're not, um, causing, and you're not changing, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 you're not stressing the animals and potentially adding that into the variable. However, exercise can modify the dystrophic phenotype. For example, voluntary running in MDX has been shown to be beneficial for disease progression, whereas it has been shown to exacerbate, uh, muscle pathology in certain types of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So when you include these assays, you, you gotta have a careful design, um, and potentially maybe only giving the running wheel for five or seven days or having non-exercise control groups, et cetera, um, to ensure that the, the, the assay itself isn't affecting your um, results. Uh, the other consideration is that these assays are inherently variable as well with strain, gender, and age differences in running distance. So inclusion of all the appropriate control is a must. Um, finally, as I mentioned earlier, you can use the treadmill as an injury uh, model for with downhill running. So you can add uh, a little more complexity to these. Um, getting even more muscle centric, the grip test is likely the easiest and most common. It's a fear-based assay predicated on the mice uh, wanting to escape uh, and not fall. It's an easy assay to perform repeatedly with li little impact on the mice. However, it's probably the most variable, highly investigator dependent. Two users might get different uh, um, absolute data, though, um, uh, fold differences might be more similar across users. And a single user might even have um, different results on consecutive days, depending on how much coffee they drank. If they pull on that tail a little harder or a little less hard, that will affect um, the, the measure of the grip. So one alternative to grip test to reduce this user variability is to use a hanging wire or inverted grid test. Uh, the drawback of these is the results are non-linear in that wild type mice on an inverted grid, for example, will essentially hang on forever, uh, while very, very weak mice will have trouble even staying on for more than a second. This gets us to uh, what I consider to be true muscle function assays. These assays, whether in vivo, in situ, or in vitro, sorry, my slide is still updating here. There you go. Can get you a variety of measures such as peak force, muscle specific force, force frequency response, contractile and relaxation kinetics. You can add additional layers to those assays with other modalities such as fatigue, mechanical properties, stiffness, injury susceptibility, etc. So what do these assays look like? Uh, here we have a picture of an anesthetized MDX mouse strapped to an Aurora 3-in-1 uh, whole animal system. The knee is pinned to prevent movement. The foot is taped in a boot attached to a force transducer. And you can see subcutaneous electrodes inserted at the level of the sciatic nerve below the knee to induce plantar flexion. When the nerve is stimulated, the foot will push on the pedal and we can measure force. If we move the electrodes through the perineal nerve, then the foot will pull on the pedal and we get dorsiflexion. Uh, 
this assay can be further modified to assess force in different muscle groups. As long as there is a joint you can measure across and an easily accessed nerve, um, other muscles that can be tested in a similar uh, similar way is like the quad, um, the the digits of the of the paw, um, the jaw, and so that gets us to the next point. In some muscular dystrophies, the masseter or temporalis, for example, is more severely affected than hind limb muscles. Uh, in this picture, we adapted the Aurora 3-in-1 to assay jaw clenching. Uh, for clarity, the picture I show here is a rat where everything is bigger, so you have a little more detail of how the, um, how the assay is set up, but the assays generally run the same way in mice. And why do I bring this up? It's, it's, uh, when looking at muscle function, you need to consider whether your therapeutic that you're testing has a muscle type specific effect. Is it only targeting um, slow fibers? Is it only targeting fast fibers? Is it only, um, is your disease more affecting distal muscles versus proximal muscles? So this might restrict which muscles you want to test. Um, in this context, we, we generated this disease in, the, in, in a particular muscular dystrophy where the jaw muscles were weak, whereas the hind limbs were not um, um, severely affected. But you can't assay all the muscles in vivo, and sometimes the muscle you want to um, see if you have an effect um, is more amenable to in vitro testing. So what's in vitro? So it's basically an isolated organ in a bath, and it's possible with any muscle whose metabolic needs can be met through diffusion, uh, such as the EDL, which is the classical way this assay is run. Here the, in the picture, you see an EDL attached, uh, again, to the Aurora 3-in-1 in a um, bath mode. As long as your uh, muscle is small enough and has a tendon or a bone that you can tie, then you can use uh, then you can use this this uh, method. Uh, other muscles that you can use are going to be the soleus, lumbar callus, uh, partial dissection of the diaphragm, etc. But it's very important that the muscle must be small. For example, you can't use a rat EDL. Um, as this, as the muscle is too large and the center of the muscle won't receive enough oxygen, will likely go necrotic. Um, so while that is a restriction, the main advantage of this assay type is you don't have to worry about the nerve. So in diseases where, let's say, your therapeutic is directly uh, affecting muscle and you don't care about the nerve, you might want to run this assay. Or conversely, if in your disease... Uh, you know that the uh, nerve side um, degeneration is too severe, but you want to see if you're still helping muscle, this might be the way to go. Um, the, you're using direct field stimulation, and you're not using the NMJ to stimulate the muscle. Uh, and the last thing you can also do, and that's how the, this assay was originally developed, was if your therapy has an acute effect, you can simply add it directly to the bath and run dose response curves. And, and those are very classical pharmacology experiments that were run using these types of, um, of hanging muscle, um, modalities. Um, in the list here, you will see diaphragm. And I wanted to show you, um, what a partially dissected diaphragm in vitro looks like. The reason I bring it up is ventilation muscles are often affected in muscular dystrophy and assessing therapeutic effects on the, on the muscles responsible for ventilation can be an important goal. I didn't go over uh, conscious animal measures of ventilation, such as whole body pleth, but here I'm just going to point out a simple consideration that if you're looking at muscle function or diaphragm function in vitro, what to think about. To the left, we have a... Um, Wild type, so DBA2 uh, muscle diaphragm, and to the right, we have a piece of diaphragm isolated from a D2MDX mouse. Uh, this D2MDX mouse that Chris previously mentioned in his section is characterized by a high level of fibrosis. And if I zoom in on these um, muscles, and pictures are not high quality, they're a little blurry, but you can clearly see 
in the D2MDX mouse, fibrotic tissue running along the muscle in white. This dystrophic diaphragm obviously displayed much lower force production than the wild type muscle. But was it because of lower levels of contractile tissue present in the preparation? There's obviously less muscle in the D2 because it, it's been replaced by fibrosis. Or do we have a very specific, uh, or do we have a deficit in the muscle specific force? So is there something wrong with the muscle itself? How do you determine this uh, when you run these assays? So this brings us to the next important point is what are your considerations when you're analyzing uh, the data that you've collected regardless of the study, whether uh, regardless of the assay, whether in vitro or in vivo? Um, most important, in my opinion, is how do you normalize your data? Common normalizations are muscle mass, cross-sectional area, body weight, skeletal size, so leg length or, or et cetera. Um, in the panel here, I, saw, I show some data from Dr. Nagaraju's group showing the differences be between uh, MDX and D2MDX mouse models. You can see that in the context of the MDX mouse, so we're looking at the black lines, peak force in the center panel is no different at any age in, in the MDX compared to its uh, strain control, the black 10. But if you normalize to cross-sectional area, you see that the EDL specific force is highly depressed um, after uh, later on in life. Now, if, if you didn't normalize your data appropriately, you might miss this effect. Conversely, now let's say you're testing um, a therapy that is affecting muscle size, for example, a myostatin strategy. You might not want to express your data over muscle size or weight because your strategy will increase muscle size and weight and therefore might wash out any increase in force when you normalize that way. So there is no, um, correct way to normalize uh, or, or absolute way to normalize. You just have to think about these things um, when you are uh, looking at your data. Other considerations are um, if you have, if you think you have a nerve effect or a fiber type effect, you don't have to simply look at muscle maximum force. You can also look, for example, at uh, the force over the stimulation frequency or the force frequency response. Um, to potentially kind of tell you is the excitability of the muscle being changed? Is the muscle getting faster or getting slower? Um, and finally, um, and the last consideration is if you included repeated measures in your design, keep in mind that if you're using younger mice that are still growing, so mice uh, under 12 to 16 weeks of age, these mice, uh, the skeletal size is going to change. The muscle size is going to change. The body weight is going to change. So when you're normalizing your baseline measure and your endpoint measure, uh, you might mask some of your um, therapeutic effects uh, because of that. Uh, it's less of a problem when using fully adult mice, but it's just things to consider. Uh, earlier on, I discussed uh, injury um, protocols to enhance your phenotype, and Chris kind of touched on that a little bit. Uh, here, what I'm showing is doing eccentric injury in vivo um, in the MD, or D, D2MDX and the DBA mouse using the ORR3 and 1, so in the gastroc, so plantar flexion. Um, so in eccentric injury, you stimulate the muscle and you get a nice contraction, and towards the end of the contraction, you pull against the direction, so you do a, you lengthen the muscle as it's trying to shorten, and you can see from here where the stretch overlays, you get a, this high increase in force. And in wild pack muscle, if you do that um, several times, twenty times, you'll get anywhere between twenty and fifty percent uh, loss of force after twenty of those, um, depending on couple of modalities, how long is your stretch, how fast is your stretch, et cetera, strain, depend, strain changes as well. However, if you look in the DMD mouse model of the D2MDX, um, these same 20 eccentrics will result 
in a much more severe injury, uh, in this case, 80%, and you'll get ranges from 60 to 90%, uh, again, depending on your, um, on your methods. Um, in the context of this study, we used a therapeutic that um, prevented injury, and you can see that we get a dose response and in injury prevention uh, 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 in the D2MDX. So sometimes uh, in, in this study, there was no change in specific force in the treated and untreated animals, but we did see an increase in um prevention or a decrease in susceptibility to injury with therapy. And so uh, depending on your therapeutic, this might be a modality you want to add. Now, what does an optimal, so I've gone through all the assays and give you a couple of ideas of how to uh, integrate them and whatnot, but I didn't tell you what does an optimal design look like. There's no such thing as a cookie cutter design that you must use. There's no must um, in any study. You have to have, you know, some considerations, including uh, kind of have different endpoints. Maybe your design would be best suited to have one or two non-invasive assays for repeated measures and to control for the, the higher variability uh, of these assays, maybe have those as secondary endpoints and then potentially complement your study with a more invasive muscle specific measure, such as looking at force in vitro or in vivo or something like that, and potentially have those as your primary endpoint. Um, and the most important thing that I can stress is don't run all the assays, because uh, it's just gonna uh, um, potentially complicate uh, your, your interpretation of your study. Uh, you should target the assays and the endpoints to highlight your therapy. So if you think your strategy is targeting muscle directly or the nerve, that helps you decide, am I going to do in vivo muscle or in vitro muscle? If your strategy alter, alters metabolism, let's say you're targeting mitochondria, for example, and you think that uh, endurance is going to be improved, then maybe run a treadmill or run fatigue uh, uh, in the isolated muscle. Finally, if you have like a antifibrotic or you think you're changing the muscle quality, you can look at your contractile kinetics. You don't need to look at force. You can just look at how the muscle contracts or look at stiffness by running, uh, uh, you know, running sinusoids on your isolated muscles. Most importantly, I think that your design should be informed by the clinical goals. Uh, and on that note, I think Sharon, who's up next, will um, talk more about the translation into clinic about all these um, assays. We've heard so far from Chris, who's talked about model selection, and Ramsey, who's talked about uh, functional assays and optimizing your protocol. I'm going to take a little more holistic viewpoint and really think about um, how to keep translation in mind when you're designing your preclinical studies. But before we start there, I'm going to start with a provocative poll question. Um, we'll see if I can get to the poll. I'll try to advance the slides. Here we go. Okay, so pulling this up. So uh, creatine kinase, probably many of you are familiar with that is a measurement, um, it can be a measurement of muscle cell integrity. So CK is normally found in muscle cells. It leaks out into the serum when you have some breach in the muscle cell wall. Um, so you saw the question there. So really there's probably not a right answer, but um, it it's becomes very important for translation because this is a, um, this is a biomarker that's frequently measured in mouse studies. It's also frequently measured in human studies. So. As those answers come in, I'm seeing what I thought would likely be the response. <laughs> it's the FDA response. It depends on a lot of factors. So I think that's just something to take in mind, to keep in mind that when you talk to clinicians, they'll tell you that CK is a lot more variable in humans than it is in the mouse. So particularly if you have people who are traveling to a study site, for example, and are on planes and changing flights and might have to walk some distance, 
you might get a, a pretty elevated CK levels. And you should also consider baseline CK levels in a po patient population are probably more variable than they are in the mouse to start with. All of that being said, if you have a dramatic impact on CK that in the humans, that can still be quite relevant. So just the sort of things to think about is it's an endpoint in a mouse doesn't necessarily translate directly in the human. Um, so moving ahead, you know, the key really is to work backwards from your target product profile. So this is what you think your therapeutic should accomplish based on what you've seen in your proof of concept data, um, the unmet need perhaps in the field and even the competitive landscape might all contribute to this vision of what you think your therapeutic should do and is capable of doing. And you can map that out directly. So this is a very abbreviated version of a target product profile, but you can you know, lay side by side what you think is gonna happen in humans. And then your preclinical study, how are you gonna demonstrate that in your design? Um, would you be using a large or small animal model? Um, if it's a, a, you know, you're targeting for a pediatric population, will you do studies in young mice? Dosing regimen will be the same, but by thinking about this just very, um, by, by thinking about it very specifically before you start your study, it will really help you design that preclinical study. And here I'm not talking about proof of concept or exploratory studies, but sort of IND enabling studies. Um, and so basically think about what endpoints are translatable to humans. So this is not an exhaustive list. And of course we know that mice aren't humans and nothing translates exactly all of the time. But if, you know, this kind of is similar to what Ramsey was saying, if you have a drug that you think is going to improve strength, and so an example of that might have been the myostatin inhibitors that have been tested and unfortunately have not done well in clinical testing, but those were drugs that were designed to improve strength. So there, um, in the human study, you're probably going to look at something like forced stair climb, um, motor function scales, grip strength. You can do similar measurements in the mouse. So if you're expecting that strength will be impacted, treadmill running might not be the right uh, preclinical assay and vice versa. Um, so this isn't a direct translation, but it's just a way that you can um, start to think about how you're gonna translate to human clinical studies. And some of these things might translate better than others. Um, you know, and particularly, I know we're talking about muscle disease, but if neuromuscular disease, if you think that you have a, um, drug that's targeting the CNS, it might be very difficult to translate some of these things. Um, so just to keep in mind, another thing that you see commonly is, you know, you can find a lot of drugs that will improve cardiac function in a mouse model. I think something to keep in mind is that in humans, yes, you can measure these things, but it would be very difficult to make them a primary endpoint. So you have to think about the variability in humans and how realistic it is to make that particular endpoint a primary. It might be a good secondary. So. This sort of gets back to the same question as CK. It's, you know, the variability in humans can impact um, how these endpoints are selected ultimately for the human study. Um, so, so a key thing that you can do is sort of set up um, a series of logical expectations. So I'm using gene therapy here as an example, but if you start on the right side of this slide, um, really, you're really driven again by your target product profile is what what kind of correction do you expect to see in humans or do you need to see in humans for this drug or therapy to be viable? So if it's stabilization of muscle weakness, for example, then you would design your functional studies to determine um, what gives you, you know, what dosing regimen or dose will give you that outcome. And from there, that actually drives all of these things that are upstream. So in gene therapy, you would look to see, you know, when you have the optimal regimen and dosing, uh, what tissues contain the vector, or how much vector got into the cell, it got into the cell, but was the RNA produced? The RNA produced, but was the protein produced? The protein produced, but was it functional? Is the histology corrected? So you can work through this logical list of things. And I think that and in each case, you now know how they correlate with the function that you're expecting to see on the other end. Um, and what's really key here is that, um, you know, in a preclinical study, you're working backwards. So you know what, you've got your desired functional outcome and you're, you know, determining how all of these things correlate with the function. In a human study, you're working in, from the opposite direction. 
So what's more likely to happen is that you're going to be partway through the study and you're going to be depending on all of these upstream factors as biomarkers to predict what you can expect to see for the function. So working through this in a very logical sequence and making sure that you've correlated all of those things carefully with your functional outcome will help you in your clinical study where you feel like you're operating blind for quite a long period of time until you see that functional outcome. I mean, it will help me make decisions. And so just finally, um, just a plea for uh, rigor in your preclinical studies. And the bottom line is, you know, these studies should more or less be set up with the same things in mind that you would have for a human clinical study. Um, I would emphasize verifying your model. Um, you know, for years there were problems, for example, with the ALS SOD1 mouse, which has a tendency um, for the copy numbers to drift and people weren't checking it. And it was causing all kinds of variability. And there was a period of time where almost everything published in that mouse wasn't useful. So, you know, genotyping the model, using SOPs when available. Um, I think Ramsey mentioned the treating MD SOPs that are readily available and online for many of the muscular dystrophy mouse models. Um, it goes without saying to report all data. If it's for a um, regulatory submission, you have to report all the data. So that being said, think carefully about the questions you're asking. Don't collect data that you can't interpret or you think is going to be difficult to interpret it because you will have to report it. Um, you know, think carefully about statistics. Determine a primary endpoint in advance for your preclinical study. It's kind of amazing how often that isn't done. Um, you know, if again, we all understand the, the concerns of having a large number of uh, variables and then cherry picking the ones that you like. Um, there's many online tools for ram randomization. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but, you know, just keep in mind that this, you know, the more rigorous your preclinical study is, the better your data will be to um, translate into your human study. So with that, I'm going to stop so that we have a few minutes for questions. So I will I will stop there. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sharon and Ramsey and Chris, for the excellent presentations. We're going to move right on to the Q&A session here. And as a reminder, if you do have a question for the presenters, you could submit it using the Ask a Question box uh, beside the media player there. Uh, OK, so let's jump right in. And our first question here is for Ramsey. Uh, if you are looking for someone to do uh, these kinds of muscle experiments, what kind of expertise would you be looking for? Yeah, that's a great question. So in general, um, a lot of the therapies are developed uh, in-house um, starting in vitro. And so a lot of people have a muscle background looking at um, um, cell lines or whatnot or isolated cells, but not a lot of people have a physiology background. And that's really what I think is the most important when running a, a animal study is to have a, uh, a physiology background to be able to integrate your uh, results from the assays in the context of a complex animal system. Uh, while these are muscle assays or or muscle uh, or related assays, integrating them in the whole animal and understanding how the physiology of the animal uh, impacts your results can greatly strengthen your ability to uh, understand your data. Excellent, great answer. Um, next question, and Sharon, you talked about histology a bit, uh, but what should histology look like in a muscular dystrophy study? Right. So we mostly um, we just kind of barely touched on that. I think on one of my slides um, where I talked about the things that you can measure fibrosis, central nucleation, fiber size changes. Um, I would just emphasize that quantification of these things is, is very important. It needs to be done carefully and done well. Um, other than that, I'm going to pitch it back over to Ramsey, maybe to comment a little further on the histology that you can do. Yeah, so, and you, you mentioned all the main things that are looked at in muscular dystrophy. Uh, one important thing is most of these, such as central nucleation or fibrosis, um, take, uh, you know, a change over longer periods of time. These are not variables that will change over uh, a four week course of treatment or won't change appreciably over a four week course of treatment. I'm thinking more specifically central nucleation. Um, and so, uh, when, if you, if those are some of your endpoints that you're looking at, 
keep it in mind in your design that if you want to see a change in fibrosis, you might have to wait longer or start your treatment earlier and prevent fibrosis rather than revert it. So, so histology can be an important tool, uh, but just like a lot of these assays, um, careful quantification and understanding of the variable um, is, uh, is very uh, important. Excellent. Um, and this question came in during, uh, Chris, your presentation. Uh, you mentioned commercial muscular dystrophy models. Is there ability to use some of the, the non-commercial models that you mentioned? Maybe we will just uh, move move on to the next question. Uh, coming in from Justin, who's asked, well, what's the difference in tension between uh, mouth muscles and hind limb muscle? Um, Ramsey, maybe I'll, so, I'll direct this one to you. So you really, so it, it's tough to compare because um, in, when you're doing jaw clench, so, so mouth masseter, uh, you're looking at torque over on the arm, whereas in if you're doing the muscle in vivo as opposed to in situ, you're looking at torque al along the ankle. So in general, actually, the masseter will produce uh, as much or more force than plantar flexion. Uh, but I don't think that you can directly compare them uh, because torque along the ankle is much more limited than uh, the clench. So, but just think about it like a rat or a mouse, they've been known to be able to chew through metal. So th those muscles are very, very strong. Um, and I do, I did mention that we're assaying masseter and that's not completely correct in that when you stimulate the trigeminal nerve to get the jaw clench, you're actually getting masseter, both superior and um, anterior, or anterior and posterior, you're getting temporalis, and you're getting a contribution of a couple of other accessory muscles. So um, uh, it's tough to say, you know, you can't really express it as um, muscle-specific force by looking just at the weight of the masseter or the weight uh, or the cross-sectional area of the masseter because there, because there are other muscles. But in general, the, the tension um, is actually pretty comparable, which is surprising given the, the muscle differences. The, the mouth muscles are smaller than the hind limb muscles. Excellent. Great answer. Um, and Chris, I can see that you're connected, but uh, we're not hearing audio. Um, are you there? Uh, it's too bad. Um, all right. Well, here's a, a question from Gerald, who has asked, uh, regarding fibrosis studies, what do you think would be the most appropriate functional study? Um, Ramsey, maybe I'll direct yeah. this one to you first. So, so this is a, a slightly more uh, difficult question to answer, uh, but usually when people think fibrosis, they think uh, tissue mechanical properties. So uh, the one thing that we've previously done in our lab when looking at uh, muscle properties, not in particular with fibrosis, but I think it would, it would track nicely, is to look at the stiffness of the muscle. So you can uh, do either a single stretch or a varying sinusoid and try to determine what is the elastic modulus of your muscle. Uh, you can also... Um, uh, uh, press on your muscle using like a, a modified AFM approach to see whether um, uh, transverse stiffness is higher versus pulling on your muscle, looking at passive tension. If, if your passive tension, you get axial stiffness differences. Um, while not a one-to-one -one, um, measure, those would be more likely very um, correlated to changes in fibrosis. Excellent. Great answer. Uh, Sharon, anything to add on to that? Nope. I'm <laughs> Ramsey is the expert there. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, here's a, a good question. Um, what about electromyographic tests for mouse models? Um, can you comment on these at all? Um, maybe Ramsey, I'll direct that one to you. Yeah. So, 
This is a, so it's one of the assays that's done, but it's a, a little less common, mostly because it's fairly challenging. As you can imagine, mouse muscles are much smaller um, than human muscles. So in, in, so in humans where it's commonly done, you can basically put your electrodes almost anywhere and get your record, a, a nice recording for that muscle. Um, in the mouse, uh, you're either isolating the muscle to get your, your EMG independent, or if you're trying to do it in vivo, you need to be very careful. Um, I'm not quite sure. Maybe Sharon can comment on the translation of mouse uh, um, EMGs compared to humans. Yeah, I mean, that's just not typically an endpoint that would you would use in a human clinical study. Um, they're used diagnostically, but not even that much anymore as people move primarily to genetics. So. Um, I'm not sure what the relevance would be to the human study. Excellent. Uh, and I think in the interest of time, we'll make this next question the last one. Um, and it's about combining different, uh, different technologies. So what are your thoughts on combining MRI of the muscle uh, like an, and other non-invasive technologies uh, to combine them with histology uh, and uh, muscle function tests to some extent. Um, does this, um, you know, does this provide an effective way of measuring it? And does it help with translation? Um, Ramsey, maybe I'll direct that to you also. So I'm going to start with our, our personal experience with MRI um, is that in mice, um, MRI is very labor intensive if you want to do it properly and, and relatively expensive. Um, Next is the analysis, um, and, and I'm mostly thinking of diffuser tensor imaging uh, that our collaborator, Rich Lovering, uh, uh, does exclu exquisitely well. Uh, but in our conversation with Rich, he, he, he usually will stress the fact that what you see is not um, fibrosis, is not inflammation. It's just increase in signal. Um, now you can kill the animal, pull the muscle, see that you have increased fibrosis or increased inflammatory cell, uh, and then say, oh, well, what we saw on the MRI is this, but it's really not a one-to-one. -one. All you're seeing is kind of more uh, T2 signal. Um, and the, the other part is um, the analysis, tracing um, muscles in 3D, uh, and you have tools that are coming up uh, that try to do it automated, but it, it's pretty difficult uh, to do, especially in disease models where your MRIs aren't as clean. In a wild type, you can see the different compartments in a in a um, dystrophic animal where you have a lot of fibrosis and inflammation. Those compartments could be mixed up, and so uh, MRI in mice is a lot harder to. Um, to uh, interpret than, than you, you might think. And yes, you do get a correlation to physiology, but it's not uh, as one-to-one uh, -one as you would think. You can't tell inflammation from fibrosis apart, for example. Um, and, and so clinically it's interesting because that's one of the ways to look at the muscle, uh, but I don't know how well it will uh, um, translate into the mouse. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, Ramsey, uh, Sharon, and Chris, for all of your fantastic insights today, uh, both in your presentations as well as the Q&A session. It's our pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah.